Hello, you're watching The Great Kinetic Bagel here, and today we have another BC election forecast. Now, before I begin, I would just once, once again like to shout out my channel members. I really appreciate all the things you guys do for the channel. You really help out and make everything work better. And if you, by all means, want to support my channel, then go down below and press the join button. If you can't afford that, I understand. And by all means, just like, share, subscribe, and do your basic YouTube things. But with no further ado, let us begin. So for the last year, possibly a little more than a year now, the BC election has not been looking very competitive. It's been, at times, looking like the New Democrats under David Ebby were going to win possibly a supermajority, 70, 80, 90 seats, possibly. We're now getting to the point, though, where that's no longer true. And I would even be so far and so bold as to say, this is now probably a contested election. The last few months have really shown how much the BC Conservatives have grown. And with two sitting MPs from floor crossing and a new robust leader under John Rustad, I think this is now actually a truly contested election. Now, the NDP, by all means, have a firm advantage here. And even if all of the swing seats right now went conservative that they don't currently hold, they'd only be looking about 39 seats to about 50 uh three NDP seats so the NDP would still have a firm majority but that would be truly remarkable to go from zero seats and about three percent of the popular vote in 2020 to excess of 27 percent 23 seats even the hypothetical 39 would be even more remarkable and it's actually getting to the point where I think it's going to get closer as we get closer to the election day. And the reason for that is because regular people, regular voters, are a little... They lag trends. And the polls lag the people. If that makes sense. So the polling is behind where the current populace is, because the last poll is in March, and now we're in April. So obviously, the polls lag the people, or because right now people's changed and the people like the current events because we're not in an election yet people aren't looking at the polls they're not looking at the politics they're not really paying attention to what's going on some people are of course that's how polling can work and makes even make sense but not everybody is and they will start paying attention though when the writ is dropped probably in september and once that happens, I think you're going to see a dramatic realignment in a lot of places. In places like Fraser Valley, or places like Southern BC, Northern BC, maybe even Vancouver Island. A lot of BC United voters are going to look, they're going to see, oh, duh, we can't win. The BC United guy's not going to win this right angle and vote conservative. Or equally, wow, Kevin Falcon is a moron who doesn't stand for anything, but this John Rustad guy, he's saying the same things as Polyev, who I like. I'm going to vote for John Rustad. Because the thing we need to know, and the thing that's really important to capture here, and there's a recent, recent poll from Angus Reid on this, 53%, according to Angus Reid, of BC United voters support Polyev. 90% of BC Conservative voters support Polyev. Why is that interesting or remarkable? Well, that means that this voter base, 53% of BC United's voter base, overlaps quite well with 90% of the Conservative voter base. So if Rustad's already better appealing to that kind of voter, is already doing better with them, once everything properly propagates through populace, Everyone is aware of what's happened, is aware of current events, because they're now paying attention, because it's now the election. I think you're going to see a lot of these people switch to BC Conservative. I think it is reasonably likely 
Not guaranteed yet, obviously, but I think it's reasonably likely that the BC United Party could get to, say, 10%, maybe even single digits. Whereas the BC Conservatives could easily be getting into high 30s. Further, I think it's not entirely implausible that the BC Conservatives could quickly run to the default resting position for the federal Conservatives in BC, which seems to be roughly... And the reason why I say that is that seems to have been roughly where the Harper government's floor was in BC, if that makes sense. But, it sorry, it's halfway between the Harper government ceiling in BC and the O'Toole sheer floors in BC. So 40 seems to be, around 38 to 40 seems to be where the conservatives do under normal circumstances. And a weak campaign like Shears or O'Toole's underperforms that in a strong campaign like Harper in 2011 or 20, uh, 2008 can exceed that, which makes sense. That's what you would expect. But that seems to be where the party federal conservatives trend to in BC. Now, because of that, and because that I this potential is there, you then also have another potential possibility here. And this is the inkling of hope for the BC Conservatives. I'm not, don't get me wrong here. David Ebby still has a decisive advantage here. He's still leading firmly. He's still the favorite to win. But there is just an ever so slight of a hope for the BC Conservatives here. Because a lot of things in BC, like the rest of Canada, are not going well. Healthcare is doing poorly. How cost of living, housing is quite high. There's a lot of concerns about the BC government's drug policy, public safety, crime. Crime and public safety are easy wins for conservative. They're bread and butter issues for conservatives. And with discontent on healthcare and cost of living, there is the potential that if there is a clear opposite, a clear distinct person opposed to Ebby, someone who's distinct from Ebby to the voter, the average voter can look at that person and say, yeah, that's a different person. They believe different things. And that person has a reasonable chance of winning. That a lot of these softer NDP voters might either stay home or hold their nose and vote for Rustad for at least one election cycle to just change the government. That does happen. You can't discount this kind of possibility. Now, I think it is a long shot, but it's not an entire un impossibility. Part of what makes this even more plausible is that in the last uh, Angus Reid poll again, where the BC NDP was at 43%, so slightly higher than what it is currently in my model, 11% of those BC NDP voters were federal conservative voters. That, again, it's just like with the math with the BC United, gives room for Rustad to win them over if you can convince those voters that the bc united or sorry the bc conservative party is better on these issues has a reasonable chance of winning is distinct from bc united is distinct from the ndp is similar to the bc or sorry to the federal conservatives leader pierre polyev and just 11% of the NDP defecting at 43%, that is roughly, what it, what is that? About 5% of the voters. While about 5% NDP to conservative and 52% of BC United to conservative in this poll, which again is 43-22 for those parties, that would give 16 points to the BC Conservatives, putting them to 38%. Which again, if you remember what I said earlier, that's roughly speaking, seems to be 
the resting point for conservative, federal conservative style parties in BC. So this is a very real chance, a really realistic possibility. And if the BC Conservatives are at 38% and the NDP is at 38%, that's going to be a close election. Now, I think the NDP voter efficiency is slightly higher here because you look at, say, Metro Vancouver, a lot, a lot of these seats are roughly the same margin. So they can bleed 10 points across most of man most of metro vancouver the bc ndp and only lose a couple seats now if you add in bc united voters going to uh conservative then it's slightly easier but there's also the possibility too that this 11 percent is not evenly distributed and if a lot of it is in the rural areas or vancouver island or something it's going to be a lot less useful for the bc conservatives but it's still a distinct possibility which is not something I really would have expected a year or two ago. Obviously not two years ago, but like a year ago. When Rice had first took over the party. Because I've touched on this before in previous videos in this series. In that a new party really needs someone of a sufficient prestige, a sufficient leadership status in a political movement to actually do anything. If it's just a random backbencher, it's probably not going to matter. Even if it's a profile backbencher, it's not going to matter. Even if it's a cabinet minister, it doesn't necessarily matter, such as Maxim Bernier. But it seems Rashid is that kind of person. He does have the influence and credibility with BC Conservatives and had the right time and right place and has made a lot of the right calls. He's had actually quite a very successful job recruiting candidates just as of the day of recording this. He's recruited several former BC NDP candidates in potentially win or I guess you could say winnable writings. I, it might be a bit of a long shot in some of these writings, but writings that this is not entirely implausible to win. Especially if some of the polls, like the most recent Main Street poll, which has them at 34%, are to be believed. So where does that put this race then? Well, we're kind of in an interesting period here. We don't really know quite yet what the efficiency of the BC Conservatives conversion is going to be. We have inklings that perhaps the BC United is a lot weaker than we think they are. Or they, with like the last Polar poll in January and the last Main Street poll in March. And we have some inklings that possibly the Conservatives are quite strong. But we're not, we're not there yet. There is still a good potential that this won't, this will still be a David Ebby comfortable win but there is one thing to consider with this too momentum matters even if you are already winning and at no point have you actually been in a position where you could be conceivably losing momentum matters why is that well it's quite simple the party that has momentum behind it that's gaining rapidly in the polls whereas everyone else is shrinking in the polls is going to get more donations is going to get more volunteers is going to get people trying to win it's going to motivate people just one easy example if your party is doing well in the polls and gaining lots of ground it's easier to recruit candidates no one wants to be associated with a party that's going to be hopeless. It's one of the issues that minor parties have, and why I say the Christian Heritage Party struggles to field candidates in every single writing. It's not necessarily because there's no one sympathetic to the Christian Heritage Party, but there is no advantage to someone who is sympathetic to them to actually run for that party because they're almost certainly not going to win. 
And if you're almost certainly not going to win, is it worth the effort? Is it worth the prestige? Is it worth possibly burning bridges later on? With other parties? With social circles? Probably not. A lot of people won't do that. Some will, of course. That's why these parties manage to field candidates. But you're going to get fewer candidates. And on the flip side, and this is where it's quite important, but don't overstate it. Donations matter. Being able to fund things matters. Being able to do advertising, it's important. Now, it's not everything. Just like any brand, picture just an easy example of this. Picture your favorite restaurant. If the restaurant is good, the advertising will work. To at least some extent. If the restaurant sucks and no one actually likes eating there, you can spend as much money as you want and it's not going to really matter. That's why you a lot of restaurants, a lot of fast food places, for example, that are like the less good ones, the less popular ones, try to use a lot of discount strategies because then they're trying to get people to come to go to their restaurant by just giving them like absurdly cheap deals. But if their food was actually good enough, they wouldn't actually need to do that. But in that kind of uh, goes forward to federal politics too. Or sorry, provincial politics. Politics in general. General politics. If a party is winning and a party's message is resonating with voters advertising works better if your message is failing and your voters are not resonating your advertising is not going to be very effective regardless of what that is i could go into more examples of this but i try not to because i don't really want to give party political parties free advertising advice if you want advertising advice political parties you know just Send me emails and we can talk about talk about that. But if you take a look federally right now, we're just going to hit broad strokes here. Why is the liberal advertising strategy so weak? Why is it failing so hard? Why is it falling so flat? Why is the conservative strategy seeming to work so well? Now, you might think at first glance, oh, the conservatives have a better advertising team they have a better marketing team maybe don't get me wrong that could be a, that could be a factor but the bigger consideration the bigger issue that matters more here to voters that matters more here in practice is performance and belief because remember here a lot of politics is vibes based for a good reason voters can't actually know what you're going to do because politicians can and do lie all the time so all they can really do is suss out if what your vibe is and see if you are actually going to do the right thing or not and the problem with liberal advertising more than any specific details more than any specific problem like examples the generalized problem is the current performance is bad. Objectively bad. There's no way to spin the numbers to anyone who cares. And in a lot of cases, what you see oftentimes in this advertising is they try to actually literally spin the numbers. They will use... An example, like a recent ad, the liberals were saying the fed, the inflation rate has fallen by some number of percentage, some number of percentage points. It was still above target, but technically, yes, the rate of inflation had slowed. That's not very good advertising or marketing for several reasons. One, the average voter doesn't really understand or care about how actual literal inflation works. Most people have a very unintu like very poor intuitive sense of how inflation actually happens, like what it actually means in practice. But more importantly, 
the issue isn't actually the number. And this is what things people get really stuck on when you're talking about political communication. The number, the hard statistic, that doesn't matter. What matters is the perception and the feeling of people. What people are feeling is that their wages are not keeping up with the cost of products because the core things they buy, food, gas, are going up. And the things they don't buy very frequently, furniture, uh, cars, whatever, are just kind of slow. Like they're not growing very fast. Oftentimes, actually, not I don't know about right now, but oftentimes they actually have negative growth in prices. In other words, they get cheaper over time. I mean, just picture your flat screen TV today versus your flat screen TV 20 years ago. It didn't exist. <laughs> but um, that's kind of the picture here. And I can't say verbatim on every single piece of advertising Ebby's done because he hasn't actually done as much to be CNDP compared to the Liberals. At least not as much that has filtered to me personally, though I am take, I'm doing my best to look for it, obviously. Um... By the way, if anyone watching this ever has like a really interesting thing from an election they want to send mention to me, just put in a comment or fire me an email. Take a look at it. But uh, the issue there, Abby has, and this is where this is could be a problem, is not only do the conservatives have momentum in polls, momentum in voter growth, etc., momentum in donation growth, the underlying statistics in BC are not great. And now don't get me wrong, they're bad everywhere in Canada. But that doesn't really matter. Right? Who... Just because it's bad everywhere doesn't mean you are excused for when they're bad in your province. When you're the government. And they're bad in BC. So a lot of their advertising strategy... A lot of their campaigning strategy is going to feel really flat. It's going to be really hard to hit off. Now, not impossible, don't get me wrong. But it's going to be harder. They're going to be facing stiff headwind on this. Whereas the conservatives are going to have a tailwind on this. It's a lot easier to attack and criticize a government for having a bad housing track record. Which the BC NDP does. Objectively. Then it's a lot, then for the BC NDP, after being in government for six years, to say, oh, we're going to fix it. Why didn't you fix it in the last six years? Why, why now? It's always been a problem. It's never not been a problem. And a lot of other things have the same thing. Then you have more specific policies that the BC NDP have actually implemented, like uh, drug decriminalization, harm reduction, and the safe supply centers. Those are quite unpopular. For good reasons. And it's really interesting to see if the BC Conservatives can make use of that. Now, it's early yet, so we don't know. So what this election potentially could be coming down to is, does the BC Conserv can the BC Conservatives convert conservative voters to their party fast enough to actually meaningfully challenge Ebby by October. And if they do, is their distribution and number sufficient? There is an interesting paradigm that a lot of Canadians have, especially in political circles, that BC is quote-unquote a left-wing province. And this election, and possibly the 2028 election afterwards, will really be the putting the test to that paradigm. Because if this is true, then Ebby should comfortably win. In if it's instead more like the rest of the country, because Canadian provinces are actually quite fluid, you don't have, say, in the U.S., the rigid one party control that a lot of states have that's really not a thing in canada except alberta which is actually quite remarkable in alberta no nowhere else is even approaching that 
Now, of course, if you do look at it and you, know, you look at the grand scheme of things, yes, parties in Canada will roughly every cycle have about two thirds control over the legislature, but it's very different character than what you see in, say, Alabama or, say, Oklahoma. Very different character. And some people seem to think BC is closer to, say, California than it is to, say, Manitoba or Ontario. It'll be really interesting to see where this goes. This election will actually be a deciding factor for this. Now, myself, I haven't fully final formalized this, but in my election theory theorizing, and by that I mean like the theory of how elections actually transpose and happen over history. My thought process is the BC NDP should become the dominant party of BC over this next cycle. Next, next 90 year generation cycle. But it's early days yet. I'm now starting to doubt that. I could have made the wrong assessment. I stand by my theory, but just because the theory predicts something doesn't mean I, an applicant of said theory, is going to make the right call of what it's predicting. <laughs> I, the end result will almost certainly follow theory. It's just whether I can interpret theory properly. But this will really be a deciding factor for this. Because if 2024 is close or conservative win, then 2020 will almost certainly be conservative win. If that makes sense. And all this really boils down to the final decision, the final thing that matters here for the BC Conservatives. And this is a thing that will filter through federally and will filter through in every other level of government in Canada. Is can the BC Conservatives win the outer core of Vancouver? So what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a tally first of winnable seats. So starting right now, they have 23. So then we start looking at, say, rural BC. So they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in the south. Okay. They have, let's, let's call it conservatively three in the Vancouver Island North Coast area. So that's now a total of 10 winnable seats. So they're at 33. Then you look at Fraser Valley and Vancouver. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, six more. So now we have 39. Remember what I said earlier? Yeah, 39. Makes sense. Now, if we push some definitions a little bit, we push some things a touch, we could say, okay, well, maybe they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten more around Vancouver and Fraser Valley area. So then I'm looking at 49. Now, 49 itself is just just enough to win a majority but if we're in a situation where the bc conservatives can only win 49 seats they're only competitive in 49 they're not going to really reliably win governments but what i think might be happening here and what i think i missed in my first thing on twitter when i said this is rural polarization is happening faster than urban polarization is. In other words, this assessment I just gave you, this potentially 49 seats the BC Conservatives could in theory win, is undercounting it because a lot of the Vancouver Island is actually in play in the long term. And if that's true, and we add the six seats of quote unquote rural Vancouver Island. I mean, pretty much all of Vancouver Island is pretty rural, but we're gonna we're gonna call it rural Vancouver Island here. Those six more seats now put them at fifty-five as winnable. 
And then if you put a couple more seats in, say, Surrey or uh, Burnaby or even Vancouver itself or Richmond. And now you could quick, very, very quickly get to the point where, yeah, no, they could get, if they're competitive in 50, 60 seats, they could, in principle, become the dominant party in BC. Is that going to happen? Who am I to say? Because that really depends. Well, I can say it, but I can't guarantee it. Because what it's really going to depend on is, is the trend in rural parts of the country going conservative truly stronger than the trend in urban areas? In other words, can the conservatives sweep the rurals while not losing the outer cores? They can already contest the suburbs. They're already winning in Fraser Valley. They're already competitive in places like Delta and Surrey South and stuff like that. But can they win, say, Richmond's? Can they win places like Vancouver or Langara? I know one person who really hopes that can be the case. And I know, tangentially, another person who really hopes it's not the case. <laughs> so the question really comes down to, can they do that? We saw Danielle Smith do this. But that's Alberta. We saw Heather Stephenson utterly fail at this. She won none of the inner core of Winnipeg. And actually didn't even do that great in the rurals. But then we're seeing right now, Tim Houston is doing this. He's winning the inner core, the, sorry, the outer core of Halifax. He's winning places like Dartmouth, uh, Clayton Park West, stuff like this, like inner suburbs, i.e. the outer core. Huh, well, Doug Ford has been doing this. Federally, it looks like Polyev might be doing this. He's running in the last ledger poll, 52% of all rural voters are voting conservative, but 38% of urban voters are. That's quite a lot. That's enough to win a lot of outer core writings. So what this is really boiling down to is, are these two trends that seem to be happening in the rest of the country, are they going to swing to B.C.? Are all these headwinds hitting Ebby and these tailwinds pushing Rustad? Are they going to make a difference for October? And I don't know. This is one of those moments in forecasting, in modeling, where I, I genuinely can't even hazard a guess. This could go anywhere right now. Now in four months, six months, well, we'll be pretty set. We'll know what's going to happen by October. If the BC Conservatives are still around 27% in October, it's going to be an NDP win. If they're in the 30s, like Main Street says, then it's anyone's game. Standard campaigns. Oh, well, that. I bid you all adieu, and I will see you guys next week with something different.